Hello and welcome to Choral Classics. You've come to the right place for 20 minutes of divine music from the Anglican choral repertoire, performed expertly by our choral scholars under the direction of Olivia Tate, our conducting fellow, and accompanied by Phoebe Chow, our organ scholar. Our theme today is More Than Hymns, choral settings of some of our favorite hymns. We've just heard Morning Glory Starlit Sky, a text which concluded William Vanston's prize-winning book, Love's Endeavour, Love's Expense, published in 1977 and set to music shortly after by Barry Rose. The words speak of the precariousness of God's love, expressed through the endeavour and expense of Christ's self-giving on the cross. Therefore he who shows us God, helpless hangs upon the tree, and the nails and crown of thorns tell of what God's love must be. An image which inspired our next piece by another great friend of this church, the composer Bob Chilcott, which is one of five well-known hymns set to new melodies and incorporated into his captivating setting of The Passion According to St. John, which premiered in 2013 in Wells Cathedral. The text, It Is a Thing Most Wonderful, written by William Walsham Howe, who latterly became known as the children's bishop for his enthralling storytelling and party-giving capabilities. The words reveal the love of God as seen through the eyes of a child contemplating the cross. It is a thing most wonderful. A number of hymnals were written specially for this church of St. Stephen Walbrook. William Windle's The St. Stephen's Penny Hymn Book can still be found online. And believe it or not, it's less than a penny, one thing that hasn't inflated in cost. George Crowley, a great journalist and poet who was rector here from 1835 until 1860, and who looks down on us today. Where is he? Over there. He published uh, in 1854, Psalms and Hymns for Public Worship. The introduction to which, dedicated to the congregation here at St. Stephen's, reminds us that our great treasury of hymns have their roots in the singing of psalms in the Jewish temple. And he commands us that the singing of hymns is a Christian duty in which the congregation each and all ought to join. The hymnal sets out many of his own poems and prayers, including this text, entitled Self-Examination. 
Behold me, Lord, and if thou find a root of bitterness within, though were the wealth of worlds resigned, O cleanse me from my secret sin. Subdue the treason of the heart, the serpent lurking in its fold, the world, the tempter's sleepless art, by thought unfelt, by tongue untold. Almighty, if it be thy will, take all the joys of life away, but let me commune and be still, and teach me to repent and pray. Let me in soul before thee kneel, descend thou spirit of the dove, inspire the heart of stone to feel, and bind me with the bonds of love. Our next hymn, Lord of All Hopefulness, was written by Jan Struther in 1931 at the request of her friend and neighbour, Percy Dermer, editor of the landmark English hymnal. The four verses are written in the form of prayer known as a collect, beginning with an appeal to God, followed by a further description of an attribute of his nature, before a petition to God, in this case, for his continuing presence from the break of the day until its end. This musical setting is by the Danish composer and former St. Martin in the Fields composer in residence, Nils Greenhow. This meditative arrangement was written to mark the first radio broadcast of the choir after the lockdown. And in it, he draws on that famous Irish melody we know so well that we associate with this hymn, particularly apparent in the solo part. Lift Every Voice and Sing was written by James Weldon Johnson and set to music by his brother, J. Rosamond Johnson, to be sung on the anniversary of the President Abraham Lincoln's birthday in 1900. 
Drawing on imagery from the book of Exodus, it's often referred to as the black national anthem of the United States. I'll read from the first verse. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Well, thank you for joining us for this edition of Choral Classics. We'll be back again next week. We can only do all this with your support, so please do donate to help fund the music ministry of this church by cash or contactless at the door. And if you're watching online, uh, the donate button is on the homepage of the website. Every contribution is much appreciated. Our final piece is another song of struggle a setting of the hymn Fight the Good Fight by John Monsell, who wrote over 300 hymns in the 19th century, but only this one and one other, O Worship the Lord in the Beauty of Holiness, survives, lives on in the hymnals of today. Inspired by the words of St. Paul to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, the hymn tells of the fight to maintain and exemplify our Christian faith in our way of life. A difficult task, but as the hymn reminds us, a fight we can win with Christ as our strength, the path, and the prize. This jaunty musical setting of the text in a calypso beat was composed by John Gardner, who died in 2011, the final piece in his five hymns in popular style, composed in 1962. Gardner is perhaps best known, certainly to me, for his setting of Tomorrow Shall Be My Dancing Day with its wonderful syncopated rhythm that's become such a great stalwart of services of nine lessons and carols across the land. You might hear some similarities in this rendition of Fight the Good Fight. Inspired by this music, keep up the fight, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>